everyone. Good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. We are very, very excited to have you today for this session as part of the Migration Summit. So just briefly introducing the summit, though I already see some familiar faces around, um, the Migration Summit 2023, organized by the MIT Refugee Action Hub, REACT, uh, Naman Crown Foundation, is a month-long global convening designed to build bridges between diverse communities of displaced learners, universities, companies, social enterprises, policy makers, pretty much whoever is interested in the key challenges and opportunities around um, refugee and migrant communities. This year, we're exploring the theme called Creating Pathways for Learning, Livelihood and Dignity through virtual and in-person events hosted around the world. And we are very excited to welcome you to the part one of Create Welcoming Campus Communities, Empower Refugee Students. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Nell uh, to introduce the rest of the team. Thank you so much, Camila. Yeah, I think we may start with just the introduction of today's speakers. Um, my name is Nele Feldman. I am based in New York and I work for the Community Sponsorship Hub. We are a smaller, fairly new organization, um, really with a mission to capacitate communities across the United States to welcome refugees in their communities. And my specific focus at the Community Sponsorship Hub is working with um, universities and colleges to really explore how they can specifically support refugee students. And I'm joined by my three fabulous colleagues and I'm just in, in, in no uh, particular order, but Kathleen Herbst, she's the next on my screen. So I'm gonna give it to her to introduce herself. Wonderful. I'm Kathleen Herbst. I'm the program coordinator um, of Every Campus Refuge at Guilford College and the um, outreach specialist for Every Campus Refuge, the organization. And Olivia next. Hi, all. My name is Olivia Issa. I take she, her pronouns. I'm joining from Washington, D.C., and I'm program lead for the Refugee Resettlement Initiative, RRI, at the National Association of System Heads, NASH. And last but certainly not least, Jane. Hi, everybody. My name is Jane Roach. I am the program manager for the NASH Refugee Resettlement Initiative, working alongside Olivia. And uh, I am joining you all from uh, New Jersey. Thanks for having us today. Maybe, Jane, that reminds me I should have been very accurate. While the Community Sponsorship Hub is based in New York, I join uh, Jane as a, as a fellow New Jerseyan. <laughs> um, th thank you, Camila, for pulling up the slides. And also, again, want to really extend a warm thank you to and to Camila and her team at the Migration Summit for making this workshop happen. Uh, as she mentioned, this is the first of two that we have. We have another one on April 27th. So just a little bit of promotion right there in case you have any uh, colleagues who may not be able to attend today's session, but might be interested. We have another opportunity to attend the workshop on uh, Thursday, April 27th. But again, thank you so much, Camila, also for supporting our technical needs today. With that, um, I wanted to just provide a brief overview of the agenda. Um, we're going to quickly touch on the objectives, the desired objectives of the workshop, and then we're going to briefly go into a typology of refugee slash displaced student statuses and resources that you can find um, on U.S. campuses. So again, this is a session very much focused on, you know, how we can support displaced and refugee students at campuses in the United States. However, if you're joining us from outside of the United States, I do think that you will find that many of these um, sort of lessons learned and many of these topics should really resonate with campuses all across the globe and are not necessarily limited to the U.S. Um, after the typology on refugee student statuses and resources, that's the, the main part of today's session will be breaking out into smaller groups. And in those smaller groups, we prepared four case studies, all talking about um, students on different statuses, either wanting to come to the United States or already being in the United States. And then each group is going to discuss a set set of questions. Um, for their respective case studies. So that will be the, the bulk of today's meeting. And then um, moving into reporting out, 
to just share some high level, uh, you know, key findings that you and your colleagues discussed in your groups. And then if we do have time, we're going to sort of send you off with uh, some very direct calls to action that you could basically implement right after le leaving the sessions. Um, so moving to the objectives. Next slide. So I realized that you may be joining us today already having uh, a really sound knowledge of uh, this topic, or you may be joining us because you're interested and you're wondering, you know, what those first steps might be. Really, regardless of where you are, I would say, in, in that journey of supporting refugee students on your campuses, what we hope to do today is increase everyone's understanding of the role that campus communities can play in welcoming displaced and refugee students who either, as we mentioned, enter the United States, are about to enter the United States, or already reside in the United States on different statuses. So I'm sure if you have been working in this field, you will encounter um, you know, students that are that are in some shape or form displaced or you know forced migration but they do have different statuses and sometimes those different statuses really impact the needs that they have the resources that they need and the supports that they benefit from um, at, on campus we also want to discuss the type of resources that are available on campuses Again, we think that there are some um, that really come to mind immediately and, and they might be more, quote unquote, low hanging fruit or really obvious. But we have our partners from ECAR here. And I think Kathleen can really share also some of the resources that might be less obvious, but as important and as beneficial to refugee students coming on campus. So we want to help you um, potentially think a little bit outside of the box in terms of what your campus can offer to this population. And then last but not least, we also want to highlight some of the successful strategies to mobilize both resources, but also campus champions to welcome refugee and displaced students. I'm sure many of you can or would agree that typically there is like, you know, one or a handful of champion, champions on each campus who really want to make this happen. Um, but they do need the broader support of the campus leadership and campus ecosystem. So again, in our breakout groups, we also want to discuss, you know, who are these advocates that you can find on campus and build alliances with? Um, moving to the next slide. So this is a blank slide. We would like to get all of you uh, to work as much as possible. So on this slide, what we would like to do to really, you know, get everyone thinking before we kick it off and go into um, our breakout groups is you should see if you with your, you know, cursor, if you move over the screen um, at the bottom left hand, you should see a, a fairly tiny green pen. If you click on that pen, it says annotate. If you click on that pen, it should open a taskbar at the top and then you should see text. And I would recommend you click on text. Um, and then you can see that Camila already showed you how, how it's done. It opens a text box on this empty slide. And we would love for everyone to take a couple of minutes and really think about, I mean, you joined today's session, which of course is fabulous. And, and, and we are so excited you're here. And we would love to learn from you when you hear welcoming campuses, what does that actually mean to you? What comes to mind? And ideally, because we are a bit of a bigger group, if you could focus on a word. So, you know, think about one to three words that come to your mind when you hear welcoming campuses. So it could be inclusion, diversity, um, access, whatever it might be that you think of first when you think about welcoming campuses in the context of refugee and displaced students. If you could add that to the slide, that would be awesome. And if you have any um, any sort of challenges accessing that tool, I just learned about it two days ago. So no judgment at all. Just please put it in the chat and we can um, we can help you figure it out. Wonderful. I'm so excited. I, I love this word cloud that is building on this uh, previously empty slide. I'm just going to give it a few more um, maybe like a, a minute or so for people to add their comments. 
But I really love what I'm seeing, um, you know, from very practical considerations of funding and providing housing to the radical hospitality and, of course, mindfulness, being inclusive, providing a sense of belonging. I also love participation, which I think can be interpreted in many different ways, um, creating access anti-racist, anti-racism training, not tokenism. Again, I think that is actually a very important and really good one where it's not about charity, but it is really, I think, going to some of the other elements here. It is about creating access and providing opportunity uh, versus right, sort of putting it on your resume as a, as, as a campus that you're supporting displaced and refugee students. Um, collaboration, diversity, this is awesome. I feel we could we could do this um, until the end of the session and and add more and more. I think there is a way to um, Camila to click stamp and then we can sort of almost or like do a screenshot so we can just like capture this. Um, yeah, I just really I nice. just saved as a as a file, so we won't Perfect. lose this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know it all anyway. Nothing, <laughs> nothing I can teach you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for just joining us in this little exercise and, and getting us, you know, thinking. I also see diverse staff. So I think that's a really um, good one to not only think about, you know, how our student body on campus can be diverse, but how that also should be represented in the staff and the faculty that we have on campus. Um, again, thank you so much. I, I want to make sure that we get through all of the different, hopefully very engaging activities that we plan for today. So I'm going to uh, ask Tamila to move us to the next slide. And that is the typology. And maybe typology, it sounds like very, uh, I guess, abstract. But what we mean by that is really the different statuses that we will touch on in today's workshop. Um, to the next slide. Right. So I would say that all of the case studies are, um, you know, so, uh, uh, invented. Um, they, they, they might sound familiar because, of course, it's drawing from, you know, real life examples. But all, none of the case studies that you will see is an actual person. Um, but it's all case studies that we came up with just to highlight the different scenarios under which students uh, can either come to the United States or already be in the United States. For private university and college sponsorship, I also have to add that this does not yet exist in the United States. Um, we're all very keen to see it coming, I guess. But again, it's not something that that is actually, um, you know, that is actually available in the United States. However, we did decide that we wanted to develop sort of a fictive scenario of how this could look like. We, of course, I think um, many people here today are aware of the program in Canada, which is a private sponsorship model, um, you know, that universities and colleges in Canada are taking Part in. So just to say for this specific scenario, that is not something that you can already find in the United States. But I think there are some many organizations that are working towards sort of the goal of, of having a similar program launched in the U.S. So private university and college sponsorship, that's going to be our first case study. Those are refugees who are still in a first country of asylum. So let's say, um, I think in our example, it is a Syrian in Jordan and being accepted to a higher education pathway that is part of official resettlement. And then through that higher education pathway coming to the United States under official under the, the official U.S. RAP resettlement program. Um, the second case scenario that we're going to have focuses on co-sponsorship. So this will be looking at a refugee who was resettled or is, re is being resettled by a U.S. resettlement agency. And then at the same time supported, you know, by providing an education, but also additional integration and wraparound services by university or a college. And just to clarify what the difference is between private and co-sponsorship, because we think it can be slightly um, confusing. For private sponsorship, regardless if it's, you know, at a university or in sort of, you know, the general public, 
Um, an involvement of a resettlement agency is not required, but a group of sponsors is taking over the full financial and integration responsibility. So while uh, resettlement agencies may very well play a role in private sponsorship, it's not, you know, their contribution in resettling is not necessarily required. Whereas in co-sponsorship, it would be a university or a group working hand in hand with a local resettlement agency to provide um, integration and wraparound services. Then I think one scenario most of you will be familiar with is, of course, refugee and displaced students coming to the United States on an F1 international student status. So we're also going to have a case study, you know, evolving around that. And then other might be not the nicest terminology, but what we mean by that is um, there is, of course, displaced students who, again, are either coming or already staying in the United States who are on a variety of sort of humanitarian or other protected statuses. The ones that we have included in our examples is a pending asylum case. Um, it's humanitarian parole, but then also temporary protected status. So humanitarian parole, just again, as an example, currently, I think the most um, prominent examples in the United States are Afghans who came after the fall of Kabul, as well as Ukrainians, uh, for example, who are coming in under, under U for U, Uniting for Ukraine. But then again, as many of you will know, the Biden administration has also opened um, humanitarian parole programs for other populations such as Venezuela. And then for most of these populations, if you're already in the United States, you can apply for temporary protected status. So humanitarian parole and temporary protected status, they do not provide what we would call a durable solution. So these are not solutions that, quote unquote, put you on track for um, permanent residency or a green card. Just to put that out there, because that is something to consider as we are, you know, um, going into going a little deeper into sort of the, the challenges and the resources that these students might require. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second to see if there are any questions on, on that typology. I'm going to open the chat. If there are no questions, I will say I can see everyone on screen. I would hand it over to my colleague Kathleen to walk us through the resources um, on campus. And thank you so much, Neely. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the ways that you can harness and address the resources on a college campus. Um, as we say on the slide, the campuses are much like small, uh, small cities. Uh, they have many different facilities, resources, amenities, um, and programming on and off campus, um, as well as partnerships within the local community to support successful integration for refugees. Um, so what does that look like practically? Um, if we can go on to the next slide, I can get into some of that. Um, campuses have an abundance of a number of different things, including um, housing, a cafeteria, often a fitness center, library, um, a farm or garden, or just an outdoor space. Many different spaces on college campuses can be utilized. Housing is one that um, is kind of that low hanging fruit. It's one that's, I think, fairly obvious as a need, um, but you can get creative in how you utilize the other um, facilities on campus. Um, the cafeteria could be used for, for um, not only having access to meals, but also having access to a community gathering space, a space to um, share some of um, some culture and um, experience with um, orientation to the United States. So here are some different foods that we have available in our cafeteria. And here's how um, here, here is um, a community of folks who are willing to um, help walk you through the process of what, what it looks like in our specific school. Um, we're looking at micro ecos ecosystems within the college campuses cultures. Every college has its own culture. And so having folks who can serve not only as cultural guides and um, orienters, um, but also for that very specific, your college campus community, how do you guide folks and how do you show them how to use different systems on campus? Um, you can, as I said before, you can get creative with this. We've had guests um, through Every Campus or Refuge who are artists or musicians and so use things like an art studio um, and supplies provided by um, the art department that they had left over for that year. Um, or um, we had a musician who would often have jam sessions with um, faculty and students um, around campus. Um, and we um, have community partners who um, have been able to donate different items um, 
in, in that realm as well. So that kind of gets into the, the side of resources. Um, so community support is something that college campuses have a built-in uh, model of. There are built-in networks. You have alumni networks. You have current students and their families, um, those networks. You have the networks of current employees and people who used to be um, employed there, people who are retired from the college. Colleges have a, a wide, wide um, scope of connections. Um, so that's a really great place to lean on that support. Um, with Every Campus of Refuge, when we're often um, working to um, host folks, we'll lean on our community and say, you know, we need a couch, we need beds, we need um, any kind of number of different items, um, as well as something like we need someone who can provide some financial literacy programs. And we have community members who will come together and say, either I have this or I know of someone who may be able to help you out with this. Um, kind of in that same line, tutoring programs are something that you can absolutely um, utilize, whether through an education department or if you have a formal English language learning program on your campus, um, you can get involved there. Student clubs um, are an excellent way to get involved. We found especially many of our campuses, um, various international students organizations often are, are pretty eager to um, show the ropes to new students um, or show the ropes to our guests on campus to be able to say, I came into the United States um, a few years ago, and I've learned all of these um, processes. Let me show you um, how to do this so that it's a little bit simpler for you than it was for me, or so that I can um, kind of pay it forward and um, being that person who can guide you. Um, career services can help out with things like resume building or um, helping to find employment. Um, and you can you can be creative with, um, again, the areas around arts or sports, athletics, um, we've often had athletic teams help with big moves or um, having teams compete to do something like a coat drive. Um, so see who can get what they uh, get the most coats for a local community partner, including the folks we're hosting on campus. Um, so you can be really creative with um, how you harness that energy because every college campus has an energy and a capacity to provide support. It's a matter of identifying those areas um, and utilizing them um, in order to provide um, compassionate resources for our, our newest neighbors. Um, and I, so the, the challenges piece, um, one of the, the large questions that we often get is, well, what if we can't afford this and um, who are we going to get to do this work? So around the cost piece, securing tuition support is something that um, would be an ongoing process um, within your campus and a con, uh, um, an area to, to communicate around. Um, but I want to challenge the idea that there are limited financial resources because often what we see is, again, that community support is pretty wide and pretty um, vast. So examining where can we, um, where can you find areas um, of support? Where can you find areas there might be some additional spaces or willingness to donate different, um, different costs associated? Um, and the capacity. Um, the lack of coordination between departments, if there are silos between different departments or different organizations on campus, um, that can be a challenge. And then administratively, um, if your administration is um, not aligned with this mission, that's worth a larger conversation. Um, but most of what this comes down to is communication. Um, communication and pitching um, the idea with a large amount of community support. So building up that community support in order to um, build in the the campus-wide buy-in as well as um, the uh, community buy-in um, in your in your college um, college ecosystem. And I'll pass it along to Neely again, or uh, Jane or um, Olivia. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, so in a couple of minutes, we're going to be going into breakout groups. Uh, to discuss some case studies based on the student's typology that Neela just presented. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to the four case studies that you can choose from. So the first case study is focusing on a refugee student in a third country coming to the U.S. on an education pathway or through resettlement. Case study two is a profile of a student resettled to the U.S., by a resettlement agency and accessing education after arrival. Case study three is about a refugee or a displaced student entering the United States as an international student. And finally, case study four is a profile of a family, which includes parolees, asylees, TPS holders already in the US, 
who wish to access higher education. So uh, once you choose a group, you're going to have a facilitator, one of us, uh, who are there, and we're going to ask you to read the case study for a couple of minutes. And then each group is going to discuss the following questions that you have up here on the on your slide on the slide. So the first is, um, what are the supports or services the student in your case study will need during their first year of study? Secondly, what are the resources you can identify on and off campus to provide these services and supports? And thirdly, who are the actors and advocates on and off campus whose support is A, critical for the success of the work and B, beneficial to, to the success of the work? So your facilitator is going to ask you to choose one person in your group to do um, to share a summary of your discussion when we return in, in plenary, um, and they will they will guide you on that. Uh, so on your screen um, for the breakout groups, um, so each each breakout group will align with uh, the the with with the number of the case studies that I just presented. So breakout group one is case study case study one, the profile of the refugee student in the third country. Um, breakout group two is if, is if you want to discuss case study two, which is the profile of the student re resettled to the US uh, by a resettlement agency. Uh, breakout group three um, is focused on uh, case study three, which is focused again on the refugee or displaced student entering the U.S. as an international student. And then breakout group four is the case study um, of, a, of the family, which includes parolees and asylees who want to access higher education. So can everybody see those breakout groups? Um, do we? So I've, I've just opened them. Um, okay. So uh, people can Maybe just assign you can just pick whatever breakout room you prefer and if you have trouble joining you can let me know and i can assign you to the preferred one great well thank you all is everyone back it looks like it yes all right thank you all so much for everything you participated you contributed to your groups i'm excited now to hear a report out from each group. Please select um, spokes, a spokesperson or people from your group to share out uh, one, the top one to two needs you identified, two, the top one to two resources you identified, and three, the top one to two campus advocates or stakeholders you identified in your groups. Each group will have around three minutes to report out. I'll pull up my timer here. Um, can we start with group one? Yeah, we can do that. And and Sarah Brethauer, she's a volunteer to report out. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Camilla, can I share my screen? Um, do you think is that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we just thought it might be easier i don't know how how you know good you can see but we thought it might be the easiest if we just um shared my screen and sarah over to you i hope you can see everything hi so the question the prompt was what are the support center services his um will need during his first year of study um at his new college he's a uh, been in a refugee camp and he's now going to school in the united states um and we talked about, you can see if one, two, three, four, five, six items were put on our jam board, but um, probably to pick the top one or two academic advisor on campus. And um, creating a network on campus through the housing, transportation, food, clothes, closet too, would be the top two and a half. <laughs> um, so just wanting to make sure that they, they're comfortable and they have community. Um, the resources would, would be um, connections to immigrant and refugee communities. Um, and just wanting to provide um, extra 
support through Financial Aid, International Student Office, Global Education and Career Center. And who are the actors and advocates on and off campus whose support is critical for the success of the work and beneficial to the success of the work? Um, well, we thought the university leadership had to be behind it, of course. I mean, they're the ones who wanted to encourage the, the program. And then the students really need to be on board and help create the network and make this the new students feel comfortable, the new refugees. There are many other great suggestions. It's hard to choose just two, but uh, I think those were the two that we would have chosen. Thank you, Sarah. I think it was great. Thanks. Thank you. That was fantastic. I appreciate it. Group one was hard at work. All right. Group <laughs> Um, hi, so our case study was about a student named Ajax, and she's coming from Kenya on an F1 visa. She got an 85% scholarship to Howard University, but um, she missed two days of orientation. Great. I'll share screen. This is uh, group three. You and some part. Perfect, thank you. So it's hard to pick only two. As you can see, we have identified several supports or services that the student Ajak might need, but if I'm going to mention just only a couple, she doesn't have a computer. So her first need is to get a computer to be able to submit her homework and, to, you know, uh, pursue her studies. And the other um, very important thing that she needs is a social security number because she's going to need that to. Uh, open a bank account and so many other things, including housing and everything else. So those were the two that um, could stand out. But as you can see here, we have identified a lot of things that she needs because she has um, brought some clothing, but maybe not everything. So she needs help with shopping and you know navigating the campus and local transportation and so many other things. Thank you. Um, some of the like the resources that she can find, like there are some resources that she can find on off campus, but majority of them are on campus. And some of like the really important ones are is, like connecting with student organizations to get a um, to kind of like help her adjust to campus life, um, international student services to help her with like the financial aspect of attending school in the U.S. And like another important one would be like writing center in case she needs like help in um, English proficient proficiency and conversation and being able to portray your ideas um, in English. So, yeah. Thank you, Alice. And some of the protocol resources, uh, you know, that she needs include the, inter you know, the international office because she's on F1 visa. So, International office maintains her immigration um, records. So that office is very critical for her um, continued presence in the US. And um, some of the other resources that are critical include the counseling center to help her to adjust to um, you know, her stay in the US. Um, if she needs any dining help, also the student affairs office, most schools have. Uh, food assistance, so that could be handy as well. And um, there's, you know, there's so many other things that we can talk about. But uh, and then the other uh, side, you know, what could be beneficial is for the professors, her faculty, to uh, be allies and to be understanding of her particular situation and to be flexible and uh, know her circumstances. Thank you, Group Three. Fantastic. All right. Group two. So, Marina, if you'd like, I can share my screen as other folks have done. Um, sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, our student was, um, I think, one of the very lucky ones who was approved as a refugee. And uh, they, uh, even though they came from a refugee camp, they were uh, admitted into the university and 
Uh, so admitted to the university through the uh, refugee resettlement agency. So they have that support. And I think that is very critical and very unique to this particular situation. Uh, so our student's name is Wamba. And um, the uh, support services that they need during their first year of study, especially, um, as you see, there are a lot of different ones. We kind of we have health. Um, healthcare, mental health, dental health as, as a group, important group here. Also, uh, some kind of tutoring services and ongoing English language support. So we all know that entering the university is not sufficient. It's important to be success successful at the university. And as your classes, academic language improves, you know, your, your English has to improve as well. So ongoing uh, tutoring services is very important. I think that would choose that, those two. Next slide, please. Resources on and off campus. Um, again, we came up with a lot of different resources, but um, help with this ESOL uh, support, whether it is on campus or off campus, re uh, reaching out to the um, non-profit organizations that provide uh, refugee supportive services. Um, maybe, I think, um, depending on the on where the university is situated, transportation, housing are critical and can be very important. Connecting, building that social capital, and connecting with other with other immigrants and refugees in the community and on campus. And for our uh, last question, uh, well, we were not that organized as the previous group. <laughs> Kudos to that. That was amazing. Um, so we're kind of um, all over the place. But um, in terms of who the actors who are critical. For the success, we started writing, like everybody was uh, mentioning students uh, because, you know, that, that peer support is very important, uh, student champions, student clubs, um, student affinity groups. Um, and then again, because this is a student who came through the uh, Refugee Resettlement Agency, that actor is critical, in, especially in the, in the, at the beginning of the journey with uh, with having support, uh, support access and support to housing, transportation and furniture. So that is one of the critical actors and beneficial. Uh, we thought about uh, religious groups depend, you know, depending on the situation, religious groups can be very beneficial uh, to have their support, elected officials, local governments. And yeah, thank you. Great. That was fantastic. That was well organized. It was. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. And group four. Um, I wish uh, somebody would share the screen. Um, our group yes, was. The can... other... Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, our group was the other humanitarian protection category. So we had somebody who, like the this family, came from uh, you know at Venez the, um, because of the unrest in Venezuela. Um, either the story is about a seven, you know, Sammy, who is a US citizen, Sasha, who is a TPS holder, and Marcos, asylum seeker, and Luis is a parolee. So they are different. It's a very complex case. So there are different needs. And all I can say is that all the things that others have shared has been all of the things that we've discussed here, too. Um, we've discussed here too. So this is um, not, nothing, I have nothing new to say, but we did talk about uh, some of the things like, um, you know, mentoring and buddy system, uh, you know, some of the differences, I mean, like what others have not mentioned. And then info on cultural and religious life and culturally uh, appropriate food access and, you know, those kind of things, those are different. I'm just mentioning because everything else has been shared. So I don't want to repeat. And so next, in terms of um, resources uh, on campus, we talked about it can be very helpful uh, when, uh, you know, the with all these um, support systems that everybody talked about. We also talked about, um, like, you know, for clothing, for, you know, groceries and food insecurity or for their uh, items to buy, you know, like, 
design closet, like I mentioned design closet, which is like where students can go in and get any supplies for the classes. That was something. And then, you know, like art gallery was mentioned as and because many of these refugees uh, have a lot of, um, in, you know, inspirations and uh, talent that they would like to share. That could be a great support to kind of promote their journey and uh, things like that. And also like all those other things have been shared, like, you know, student well-being, counseling, uh, student welfare, skill centers, all these things have been shared. I think one other thing that was shared that was on campus was that professional development and cultural humility and sensitivity training across campus, which was not mentioned in the other ones. Uh, next slide, please. And here, what actress, like, you know, I, we, we, everything has been shared again. I think one thing we talked about is like uh, the diverse staff uh, and, uh, you know, faculty and student who are the DEI collaborators who work on these issues, who can provide support and who can create a community of support for them. So not just one person going in for policy changes, but uh, again, policy change was discussed widely in our one that, you know, if there is a policy change that happens, that can be like the institutional support that is that is larger than one person su providing support. That was very important for our group. Uh, again, all of these other things have been shared, like, you know, community, you know, societies, clubs, people with country of origin, you know, all of these things have been shared. But I think that was kind of the, something that was different, I would say. Again, you know, like the support with the judiciary system was very much discussed in all the three because that's very important for this complex group. Everybody needs a different kind of legal support. So that was, again, discussed a lot. And religious support was discussed a lot also. Thank you. Thank you. You all were very, very thorough. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who participated in those groups. Uh, I'll pass it back to Nela. Yeah, amazing. I'm I'm so inspired. It's such a wonderful group to, you know, work with this afternoon, at least here in the in the United States on the East Coast. I want to be really mindful of everyone's time because I know we're joining from different time zones. Um, we do have a few sort of like, you know, call to action, depending on where you are in, in the journey of getting your campus involved. But I would say maybe the most important call to action, all of today's speakers, we're going to put our email addresses in the chat. So we'd love for you to stay in touch. We'd love for you to sort of, you know, be aware of the different programs and initiatives that we are hoping to um you know, launch jointly, but then also organizations separately. So again, thank you so much for joining. If you just want to hang on, we're going to put our email addresses uh, in the chat and then we're going to wish you farewell. And uh, thanks you, thanks again to the Migration Summit, to Camila for supporting us today. Thank you for everyone for joining and really participating. It, it was such a pleasure um, to connect with all of you today. You're very, you're very welcome. It was amazing. And, and I love to see, you know, such a workshop that it really, you know, focuses on a, on a very specific issue, but a very important one. Uh, and so Nila, something that uh, some folks have been asking, is the workshop on the 27th going to be the same as this one? Or people that attended today could attend also on the 27th? I, I mean, unless you want to continue the conversation, I would say it, it will be because we were initially hoping that we can't, that we would be able to do one focusing on sort of mobilizing students to do this work and the other one focusing on more, you know, staff, faculty, administrators to do this work. But then I think reality hit us in terms of that's very challenging to navigate in terms of people registering. So I think it will be a similar workshop um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to really follow um, a similar sort of outline and, and agenda. So again, if you, you're more than welcome to participate twice, but if you have colleagues or friends like anyone in your networks who would, uh, who you think would be interested, you know, please spread the word and, and have them join us on the 27th.